I am Laura Blyle. I am the Director of External Engagement here at the University of Illinois Research Park. We are uh, excited and happy to be the host of the FAST Center, which is a program that is supported by uh, the Small Business Administration. There is one FAST Center in 24 states that helps to provide uh, extra support to those of you who are interested in seeing if your technology is a fit for the SBIR, STT, our federal grant award program. We have many experts in our program. Um, we have a community that of experts, uh, of both amateur and longtime experts, I would say. And one of those folks is the person who's gonna kick off today's session, um, our, the fourth and final of this uh, training session. But as I mentioned a little bit ago, we will be having more training sessions throughout the summer. So. Uh, feel free to engage with us. We also have one-on-one -on -one support available and many other ways to engage with our program. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce Roland Garten. Roland has been a part of our community and helping many of our startups uh, with SBIR support for many years uh, and has seen many things. And one of the, my favorite things about hearing Roland present is when he gives anecdotes of others, because I think we can all learn from successes and failures of our peers. And Roland has plenty of stories. So yes, while there are lots of nitty gritty things that we need to know about this, learning from our peers is really important and learning from some of those anecdotes anecdotes is too. So thank you for being here, Roland, and for sharing your institutional memory of SBIR with all of our community. So thanks so much. Yeah, you know, a lot of those memories have hardened into scar tissue over time. So it's uh, kind of painful to think back on some of them, but hopefully we will be able to eliminate and reduce the amount of problems going forward as we propagate the knowledge. The other instructor today is also a longtime SBIR awardee and uh, in, an expert, and that's Jed Taylor, and he will be handling the, the last half of the session. This is sort of a catch-all odds and ends session. We're, we're going to touch on lots of different topics. Jed and I got our heads together and thought about which areas would be most important to cover that really hadn't been covered yet. And some of them include what's advertised, and some of them go a little bit beyond what's advertised. And so I will talk about technical objectives and what to put in really good technical objectives. I've got a slide on steps you can take to prepare to protect your IP in a proposal. And I want to talk a little bit about the logical flow of the proposal, how to construct a main argument so that it flows well throughout the entire proposal. And then Jed will talk about key personnel. He'll talk about structuring phase one for phase two, what to say in phase one and phase two. And then Jed has served and continues to serve regularly as a reviewer for NSF. And he'll talk about his experiences as a reviewer. That's really critical because you have to address two audiences. Jed will tell you about them, but that's your main audience is that reviewer panel and the program manager, and you have to keep them in mind. So knowing what that experience is like is very important. Please don't hesitate on the questions. Unlike last week, I now am able to monitor the chat channel. So I will be looking at the chat channel. I may miss some, so anybody, you know, Laura, Kathy, feel free to chime in if I miss a question, but ask in chat and I'll pause from time to time in between sessions to make sure that there's time for questions. The questions so far in this session have been very good. So please keep the good questions coming. One of the areas for technical objectives that's critical is that they be at the right technology readiness level. And you remember the slide, those of you who saw session one, uh, Alex presented this in session one. These are different technology readiness letter uh, levels. It's sort of a gauge of how far your technology is from race research to being available to the public. Nine is available to the public. Uh, number one level is just sort of an idea that's in the lab and you're wondering about the nature of things, it's not even formed well formed yet. It's basic research kind of level. Where you want to be with your SBIR technical objectives is about between levels three, maybe up to six. The agencies differ a little bit on what they like. The Department of Defense and NASA tend to like higher levels in their proposals. NSF, Department of Energy uh, tend to like lower levels. They, are eight, they usually fund earlier stage, but you have to think of if you're in these right levels, if you're at the right readiness level. Phase two, you should be a little further along. 
So you're thinking about maybe TRL level five or TRL level eight or in between seven and eight for a successful phase two proposal. So that's the sweet spot. You need to be far enough along that the idea is well formed that you can have something to prove feasibility, but not so far along that it's already in practice. That's the sweet spot. How do you tell if you're innovative enough in order to be eligible for SBIR funding? Well, here are some gauges. You need to be advancing scientific knowledge. If you're doing something that's already been done before, that's not really new. Uh, you need to develop something that's protectable. If in fact your project develops protectable intellectual property, whether it's via a trade secret or a trademark or a copyright or however you protect it, if it's protectable, it may be, that's a good sign that it's innovative enough for SBIR. SBIR proposals expect a high level of uncertainty and risk. By definition, if you are doing something new, it has not been done before, therefore it's innovative, therefore it's risky. You're not sure it's gonna work. And so your technical objectives have to hone in on the areas that are the most uncertain and the riskiest. Phase one is primarily a de-risking approach. If your technology results in peer-reviewed scientific publication, if it's something publishable that's going to advance the knowledge, that's a good sign that it's innovative enough for um, SBIR. If you require a lot of expertise to do it, that's a good sign. If, if mostly you can outsource the work or if it's uh, you know, undergraduate level programmers or technicians that can do it, it's probably not requiring a lead the field, state of the art kind of level of effort. And if you're aware of what's going on in the field, it's very important that your technical objectives and your document itself present a picture of lead the field. And by doing that, you need to be aware of everything else that's going on in the field. You need to show that you know what else is going on and you're aware of them, you're adapting them, you're different from them, you're advancing the state of the art. Uh, a good example of something that's innovative would be like a new drug for Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, no one's done that before. They're working on it, but work in that area is innovative. A, a non-example that you get a lot or that I get a lot is you know, some kind of new app that's, that uses existing app-based technology to do something. Maybe that particular thing hasn't been done before, but the app technology has done before, the database technology has been done before. So some kind of an app is likely not to be new unless there's some science in the app. Also a good test for whether you're uh, innovative enough is to contact the program manager. This is a very good question to ask them when you contact them. You say, you know, here's what we're thinking. Is this pitched at a right level that you think would be fundable? With the NSF program, you've got the project pitch. It's a great way to contact the program manager. You send them the project pitch, you get feedback on it. If they've got some concerns, they'll let you know. Now, if you're at these levels, if you're innovative enough, then you're ready to write some really good technical objectives. So when you write a good technical objective, here are the main things that you wanna be looking for. This is primarily at phase one, a feasibility demonstration which means your technology has to do something. It has to perform. It has to achieve certain performance characteristics that have not been done before. And so you want your objectives to ask questions or to say, we will be successful because our technology can do X, Y, and Z. You don't wanna say, well, we're gonna research whether this works or not. You don't want to say, we will characterize the feasibility of something. You don't want to use those kinds of words. Those are researchy, basic research kinds of words, but the TRL level that's appropriate for SBR goes beyond basic research. It's got to be pitched at, will it work? Does it demonstrate feasibility? You, somewhere between three and six objectives are good. Four is a good number. I see four a lot, but uh, these have to emphasize the highest risk areas of the project. And when you create your objectives, number them. Objective number one, X. Objective number y, uh, two, Y. Objective number three, whatever it is. So give them a good clear number. That will help develop your work plan later on because your work plan will support the objectives. will explain how you're going to accomplish these objectives. If they're numbered, it's a little easier to refer to. Um, the good technical objectives have good level of technical risk. Uh, they have to be reasonable given the budget. A common problem is that phase one proposers try to do too much. You know, we're going to create a whole new technology that's a complete technology. And by the end of phase one, we'll be on the market. No, no, no. At the end of the phase one, you're going to have something that given certain constraints can demonstrate the highest risk area 
to justify phase two, but it's not going to be the end of, end of the whole project. Phase two is the is where you're ready to start commercializing the product and bring it to market. Phase one is a feasibility demonstration. You need to have your success criteria spelled out in the technical objectives. You have to say what it will do, how you will measure it, and to what specifications and what criteria uh, criteria it will do. Main goal of phase one is to get phase two. You want to continue. So you want to write technical objectives so that once you have achieved phase one, getting phase two is a no brainer. In your final report for phase one, you want it to say, here's what we said we would do. It would perform in a certain way under certain characteristics. Here's what we actually achieved. Here's how we measured it. So yes, you need to fund us for phase two because we achieved phase one. We want to go forward, a no brainer. That's really what you want. A good mnemonic for remembering what to put in phase one objectives is the SMART mnemonic. Specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. In reverse order, time-based is almost uh, written into the proposal because you've got the proposal timeline, a one year or six month usually in phase one, two years in phase two. Relevant, you've got to have goals in, that technically meet the marketing demand that you've outlined in the commercial section. They have to be attainable. Quite often, I see a problem people trying to do too much, putting too, too many goals in uh, and not having enough budget to do them. You have to be able to measure them and they have to be very, very specific. So a simple mnemonic is a good way to remember what to put in a good objective, smart. Let's look at some sample objectives now. Here are some weak ones. All right. The first one, results from potential customers will be used to help determine which features are most important in our minimal viable product. All right, uh, you know, this is not a good objective because for one thing, it's commercial research. Your objectives need to be technical objectives, not commercial marketing research. So that makes it not a good one right there. And by the time you write a phase one proposal, you should include that in proposal, what's going into the minimum viable product. So this phase one objective is not good because it's not far enough along on the TRL chain. If you are still wondering what goes into a good MVP, you might not be ready yet for an SBIR proposal. Let's look at the second one. We will begin by collecting data on current agronomic best practices and by validating several unknown technical specifications to demonstrate and meet the primary objective. All right, this one is also a little bit vague. It's not clear at all what anything will do, what performance the thing will have. It's sort of, we were gonna go find out what's really important and you need to be further along in your phase one description. The other two are similar. You can read them on your own time. I won't go over them, but they don't really say what the performance criteria are. They don't really say how you're gonna measure things. They're not clear and specific enough. They don't meet the SMART criteria. Well, by contrast, let's look at some stronger project objectives. All right, these are specific, they're measurable. When you achieve them, you'll be able to say, yes, we achieved it. We will develop, for example, a single unit prototype that transfers a kilowatt of power to location a thousand miles away with loss of only 0.15 kilowatts using components at the total cost of less than a thousand. It's very clear. You know whether you've done it or not. You know how well you've done or not. Specific, measurable, you know what you get. The other two are similar. They say exactly what you will produce in terms of performance, in terms of standards, in terms of criteria. All right, so these are examples of strong and weak objectives. Let me look and see what questions have come in. Will the style of writing apply to NIH as well? Yes, to all the agencies, this is kind of universal. You need to have very clear, very specific objectives. Now, there is some variance though. Department of Defense, NASA, the, uh, the, the contracting agencies will tend to look for even more specific objectives than say NIH, than will the NSF or Department of uh, Energy, the granting agencies. The granting agencies and educations, the granting agencies will be a little less strict about how specific you are. NIH is, is maybe even less strict than NSF because NIH they're thinking along the terms of basic research. If you use the term characterize to NIH, the reviewers will know what the term characterize means. It, they, they understand that that's got meaning and characterizing something produces scientific value. 
reviewers and other agencies might not be familiar with the term like characterize. To them, it means, well, what's it gonna do? What's it actually gonna perform? How, how, how will it perform? Okay, uh, let's see. Jed also pointed out here, yeah, the first example is, is an example that he sees all the time. People saying, I finished i therefore give me money. You know, finishing i is really good, but you demonstrate that you got something out of i by virtue of the information that you include in the proposal, not that you just brag about the fact that you did it. All right, uh, here's a question from uh, Abhinav. I always get stuck in striking the balance between specific technical objectives versus fundamental science. Um, the, the, I think the problem is opposite of what you said. You said, I know these are mutual exclusive, but they aren't. The one bleeds into the other. And so, Finding the sweet spot is, in fact, a judgment call. And here's a case where, give us a call. Let us look at your specific example because you have to make a judgment on a case-by-case -case basis exactly where the sweet spot is for an SBR proposal. So yeah, this is a tough spot. People get stuck on it. It's one of the hard parts of writing the proposal. Do it well and you increase your chance of success. It's worth getting input from others. So contact others and give us a call, office hours, schedule a session and we will help you with that to the best of our abilities. All right, I'm gonna move ahead to protecting IP, but let me pause for a minute and see if there are any uh, questions or, or comments from Laura or Jed. No, I I, Roland, I think you've done a great job of this. I, I think you've got some good examples and I, I agree with all of them. I think you hit on the main points. Okay, I've got one slide on steps you can take to protect IP. This is a very legitimate concern that you need to, to be aware of. The, uh, the main thing you can do is to make sure or to reduce the amount of protectable IP that's in your proposal. That's really the best thing you can do. If it's possible to write a proposal in such a way that you don't have to disclose any proprietary information, that is ideal. Now you can't always do that. Sometimes you have to reveal some proprietary information in order to communicate technically how you're gonna accomplish the great things that you're going to accomplish. So there are levels of protection that the agencies have built into the review process and the proposal process. Now it's in the agency's best interest to protect the IP of the applicants. They want a strong program. They want applicants to feel comfortable submitting proprietary information if they have to. So they want to protect your IP. They do what they can. They can't do everything, but here's what they can do. For one thing, they require the reviewers to treat proposals confidentially. Jed will tell you as a reviewer, he has to sign a document that says he will treat information confidentially. So they bind the reviewers to be confidential. Also, and I didn't mention it in this text, I'll have to add it, you can recommend viewers to review your proposal and reviewers not to review your proposal. This is a bullet list that should be in this slide and will be in the future. I see now that I forgot to put it in. But in the proposal, you can say, please don't have individuals review this proposal who are potential competitors, who don't like the technology, who have given us negative reviews before, or for whatever reason, you can specify people to not review. Also in the text itself, if you have to include proprietary data, you can mark it. And each agency has a certain way of marking. You have to read the guidelines and find out how they like you to mark your information. But proprietary information, you can spell out, okay, start here, stop here, this is proprietary information. You can say, okay, in another section, this is proprietary, end of proprietary. It's not acceptable just to mark the whole technical part proprietary. They will not let you do that. You have to really identify the truly proprietary marks if you have to include that. Also, you submit a legend. When you submit the proposal, there's a legend and each agency will give you the wording in the legend. The wording will say pages such and such pertain, or contain proprietary data, treat them confidentially. If you mark in the legend, and if you, the, which pages are prepared, contain proprietary information. If you mark the proprietary information itself, then if an agency is required by law to release the contents of proposal, say for some kind of legal action or other public information action, they are allowed to not reveal any marked information. So that's another, another level of protection that you have. All the agencies have a box on the submission form to check if there is proprietary data. So check that box. Those are things you can do. A couple notes here. The abstract is uh, 
is not is public information. So do not include any proprietary information in the abstract. And then to reiterate again, the best thing you can do is to leave proprietary information out of the technical section of the proposal or where you need to have it, minimize it and mark it very clearly. All right, just one slide on IP. Uh, it's a deficient slide, so I give myself a poor grade on this slide, but I will improve it. What, uh, what questions do we have on IP protection? All right, if any come up, feel free to get in touch and ask them as we go along. All right, I've got a few slides now on the logical flow of the proposal. This is something that often gets overlooked, the top-down way that your argument has to flow. You need to tell a convincing story from the beginning to the end. The sections all have to link together. They all have to be mutually supportive. So you have to have a very strong logical flow from the beginning to the end that's structured in a way that reviewers can look at it very quickly and very easily understand what your main arguments are. Jed will talk a little bit more about this. There are two audiences. There's a commercial audience, there's a technical audience. You have to appeal to both of them. For the commercial audience, you don't wanna go into too much technical detail. And with NSF, that's up front. You've got a com your commercial sections of the proposal appear first. You don't wanna make them too technical and too filled with jargon. They have to be available and accessible to a person with a good general technical background to, to very quickly see, okay, I know what this is about. The technical people will review it later on. That's the technical section. But you've got to appeal to both audiences. And you need to have a top-down approach where you spell out the big conclusion at the very beginning. Here's the big thing we will do. Here's the wonderful things that will happen as a result. Now, this is kind of the opposite of the way a lot of academic uh, writing goes. A lot of academic writing, you set out all the propositions and then at the very end, you reach the grand conclusion based on this incontrovertible evidence that you've pre presented. The great conclusion comes at the end, not with an SBIR proposal. With SBIR, the big conclusion, the main point comes up front so people get it. Okay, right, let's see how they're gonna prove this. Now, before writing a proposal, never mind the guidelines, set the guidelines aside. The guidelines will tell you what sections of the proposal you have to write to. But don't worry about them. Don't worry about guidelines. Think instead initially about your main arguments and draw up a case statement. It's an informal, unofficial document that says, here are the main reasons we think that, our agent, that the agency should fund our proposal. Just the main arguments. And then you look at those main arguments and you say, okay, how are we going to support these in the proposal? okay, we're kind of weak in the commercialization area. Maybe we're not ready to write the SBR proposal yet. We should do a little bit more customer discovery first. Or you look at it and say, boy, we really know the market, but I can see where our argument about the fact that we're ahead of everybody else in the field, we can't support that because we don't know exactly what some people are doing in the field. We better do a little bit more research in this area. So we're better positioned to represent the state of the art. Where it's weak, you do homework. So the case statement really can guide the work that you have to do to prepare a competitive proposal. Let's look at the overall flow of a typical argument. All right, and these are the main points you're gonna make. This is what a really good SBR proposal looks like in general. First of all, you have to establish that there's a strong need and a compelling demand for the proposed solution. I like Alex's wording on this. He says, you have to have real people with real problems willing to spend real dollars. You, you, you jot down in your case statement, okay, here's our argument, you write it out. Here's, here's what we're going to say as, as a main point. And then you think, how are we gonna prove that? How are we gonna prove that in this proposal? And you have a bunch of bullet points and say, here's basically how we're gonna prove that that's the case. All right, there's a compelling need. Once you've figured out how you're gonna establish that, then you wanna say, okay, our, our technology can meet this need. It, it, the meat and it can't be met now because the technology doesn't exist, but we can develop it, but it can only meet this need if it can do A, B, and C or whatever. These A, B, and C will become your technical objectives. So you have to identify the areas of the technology that are lacking that if they're addressed can meet the market need. So between one and two is, is a strong link here. You have to link your technological solution to the market need. That's a link. Right, once you've developed that these are the technical areas, then you have to prove to your reviewer 
that the technology is too new, too risky. It, it can't be fundable by other sources. All the reviewers look at that. And sometimes we've had proposals rejected saying, yes, this is too far along. This is a great business proposition. You've proven that it's going to work. You don't need our risky money. You just go to investor and, and move forward. You're ready to go. You don't need NSF. You don't need NIH. You're, you're beyond that. So you have to make that point. And you also have to say, okay, here's how we're going to make it do A, B, and C. This is your technical plan. This is where you spell out how you're going to meet those technical objectives. At the same time, you also have to say, and here's why we're qualified to do that. We are lead the field people. We're on top of it. We've got national global expertise that nobody else has. And so we're qualified to do this. Here's where you say, okay, our research plan is really rigorous. It's scientifically applicable. It's scientifically sound. And then once you've proven that you're going to be able to do it with a good research plan, you say, here's how we're going to prove it's work works. Here's our evaluation. Here are our metrics. Here are the analytics that we're going to use to make it happen. This is your overall case statement. Write these points out before you even look at the proposal. Bullet lists about how you're going to prove each one that will guide your research, that will guide your, your work to get ready to go, that will divide, guide your proposal development. And then, then you look at these arguments and say, okay, now how are we going to make this fit into the proposal guidelines? If it's NSF, these points all get kind of melded together in an elevator pitch, the very first section. So there's not a strong one-to-one -one correlation between these points and the elevator pitch. They all get represented somehow in the elevator pitch. The individual sections then are a little bit linked more directly to, the, uh, to these sections. Like the work plan, the last section, is uh, pretty much uh, three or two, four, and five. Those would constitute half of your proposal, the work plan, the technical objectives, how you're going to make it work, how you're going to prove it. With an NIH proposal, you've got three sections, the significance and approach. Uh, and then so the significance, obviously, numbers one and two talk about the, tech, uh, the significance. The approach is more the later sections. So after you're developing the main flow, then you figure out how best to represent it in the proposal guidelines. And when you do that, you eliminate or reduce at least a very common problem. The very common problem being that you start with one section and you write that section. And then the next section you write it and you say, oh wait, this has a lot of overlap with the previous section. How are we gonna take what we wrote in the previous section and relate it to this section? And later on you say, oh, this has overlap in the previous two sections. How are we gonna have to rewrite those two sections so that we aren't just saying the same thing over and over again? If you have a top flow approach to begin with, and if you think about which sections contain the main points of your arguments ahead of time, then writing the proposal flows quite naturally. Then it flows into the proposal format without the duplication, without the redundancy. And it's a much better story. It's a much better narrative. All right. So uh, let me pause again. This is the end of my section. We're going to switch over to Jed now. I'm done with my half of the presentation. But let's pause and see if there are any questions that I can answer before we go on. All right. You still will have a moment because I have to stop sharing my screen and Jed has to start sharing his screen. If there are any other questions, feel free. Don't hesitate to pop in the chat or to get in touch with us later on. So I will talk to you later. I'll look forward to your questions as you develop your proposals. Now to Jed. Nothing, huh, Roland? You answered all of their questions. Yeah, that's not a good sign. Either they're confused. <laughs> All right, here's a question. Benchmark for too risky? Um, oh, you know, that's a good question because I usually don't get that. I usually get it's not risky enough. It's too risky if, um, oh, let's see. Uh, Jed, I'm going to punt on this one. Well, let's see. The question is, how do you know if it's too risky? What would you that's say? A, that, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. I, I don't know if there's a, a definition of what too risky is, but I can give you some examples of, of where I've seen that. So uh, they, they, so I'll, I'll talk to it in terms of NSF, because that's, that's where my expertise is. And NSF will say that they fund things that are too risky for other people to invest in. And we had a, we, and those that have heard me speak in the past, I, I've given this example before. We had a team that uh, had some technology and they were used to pitching in front of venture capitalists where you're usually trying to 
de-risk, you're trying to present an opportunity, you're trying to, when you're pitching to venture capitalists, those are people that give you money. Uh, you're usually trying to show that you've reduced the risk as much as possible when you're trying to get their money. So they presented two opportunities to take their product to market. They said they could go down this path or this other path, and they could do either one. And it, it virtually assured that they were going to have success. And when they presented that opportunity in their phase one, they were rejected. And the program manager in the feedback said, uh, where's the risk? There's no risk. And they said, if you choose that riskier path, uh, which you're not sure you're going to be successful on, then we would have funded it. And so he said, Re redo that and then submit again in six months, which they did. And he funded that. Okay. And so I'm not sure that answers your question of what it means to be too risky or risky enough, but uh, there needs to be some level, level of risk there that shows that you may, may or may not be successful. All right. And, you know, Matthew also asked, uh, how do you know if it's, if it's risky enough? Do you have my slide on uh, indicators, Jed? Can you pop I, back? I do not. I changed my slide deck here. Just, okay, just so the you way got, I'm presenting all right. it now. Uh, I had a slide earlier on that, that talked about uh, indicators of risk. And the opposite for each one of those slides, and the slides will be available to you. You'll be able to get them. Yeah. But if you look at that slide that says indicators of risk, if you look at that slide, then the, the opposite of each one would be not risky enough. Like I said, if it's publishable, that's an indicator. Well, if you're not doing anything that's publishable, maybe it's not risky enough. If it's yeah. been done, if it hasn't been done before, if it's advancing science, that's a good indication. If it hasn't been advancing science, on the other hand, <clears throat> then maybe you're not risky enough. So look at the slide on indicators and think of the opposite. And that would be a, a good way to tell if it's maybe not risky enough. Yeah. Good question. Okay, great. Thanks, Roland. And uh, we'll leave some time here at the end for a couple more questions. So uh, I've just got a couple of areas that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about key personnel and then a few other topics and then spend some time uh, talking about the at the end about um, uh, what it looks like uh, at a review panel. And then we'll leave some, some time at the end for question and answers. So uh, I want to spend a time talking a little bit about key personnel because it's a situation that's important for all of the teams putting together uh, SBIRs, especially early stage teams if it's your first time uh, putting together an SBIR. So a couple of things that I think about when I'm helping teams construct their teams uh, or helping a person construct their team uh, for an SBIR is what do the team members look like? So the key things that I like to think about are that you need to make sure that you've got the key people to carry out the work, the technical work, that's one of the first things that uh, reviewers will look at. Uh, and, and also focusing on that you've got the key te technical expertise. Uh, the, the, you can often, it's easier to find the, the business people to help out on the business side of commercialization, but you've got to make sure you have the technical expertise to carry out the work because that's often what's discussed on the uh, review panel. Uh, one thing that I always want to make sure of uh, that people understand is that often uh, first time, especially first time SBIR teams, is that there will be gaps in your team and that's expected and reviewers often expect that, especially in, uh, in the NSF review panels. And I'll, I'll show you a slide here uh, after this to show that. Now, the key thing that you need to think about is how will you fill those gaps in your team and make sure that you address those. So I put this quote here in the in, in the bottom of this slide because I think it's something important that I've heard several times from different program managers. They've said they often say that the gaps are not the problem in your team. It's the unknown gaps that worry me. Uh, that's what the program manager I've heard or several program managers say. And what he means by that uh, is that is what he meant by that when he's when he told me that. Uh, is that it's when you don't have gaps or you have gaps and you try to ha hide them, that's what's worrisome, okay? So how do we address that? So first of all, let me show, uh, let me show this slide that I've got here. This is, and this date is a little bit out of date. Uh, I got it about a year or two ago and it was, and, and there, there, there's a little bit of lag in the reporting, but uh, this is something that's really interesting that shows the different agencies and how many times there are, how often they fund first time SBIR award winners. And I, I, I had another slide, but I couldn't track it down right before this meeting, but shows the number of people that are often in SBIR teams. Now, I think the key thing to uh, note here is especially NSF, they are very open to funding first time SBIR award winning teams. Okay. Now, the reason they do that is because their track, they have shown their data shows that first time SBIR award winning teams actually outperform 
teams that have received multi, multiple SBIRs. Okay, so that's interesting. So if you're sitting there watching this going like, ah, do I have a chance to get this SBIR award? Because like, I've never done an SBIR. I'm not sure I can do it. Absolutely, you can do it. Okay, they are eager to fund SBIR, uh, uh, first time SBIR award winners. And the average size, I, I, like I said, I couldn't find the slide right before this, but the, the second slide after this in the presentation showed the average size of teams it's very small. The average size is like just a couple of people, if not one, like many times they just have one, one person. And my point in showing this is that you are all, you are often going to have major gaps in your team, which is all right. Every it's, it's expected you have gaps. So my strategy has always been, and what I recommend is to uh, don't hide those gaps because <laughs> program managers know all the tricks when you try to hide them. So just acknowledge them and find out and, and then have a plan to address those, okay? So here's a way that I have found is a good way to, to uh, uh, highlight this and come and show that your plan to address them. So is what I'll often do in the proposal is come up with a three column table that shows the role, your short-term mitigation plan, and then your long-term mitigation plan for addressing these gaps, okay? So for instance, I just put some examples down here and like, these are not great examples. I threw these together this morning before the presentation. But for instance, if you've got like accounting and finance, you can, you can have a short-term mitigation plan like using an hourly bookkeeper located in, in the university research park, familiar with university startups, and then engaging with an entrepreneur in residence at Enterprise Works for strategic financial advice as needed. Okay, so you're leveraging the research parks, entrepreneur in residence uh, uh, resources that you're probably already or you may be in, engaging with already. That's your short term mitigation plan. And then you've got a long term mitigation plan that you're going to hire a director of finance in Q1 of year two of your business plan. Okay. So that shows that you have got a plan. You've thought through this. You know that you've got a gap. You've got a short-term pl uh, plan to address it. And then you've got a long-term plan how you're going to address it into the future. Okay. And then uh, you've got some, you can have your roles. You've got technical. You've got business roles that you need to address. You've got short-term plan to address them and a long-term plan as well. Okay. So as I'm writing a proposal, I will often have a table like this that has the key things that I, I, I know that are gaps in my team and a short-term and long-term plan to address them. All right, a quick question, uh, Stephen Fleming, what are multiple award-winning winners doing more poorly or does NSF straight up prefer first-timers? No, so is what they did, uh, and I don't know if Stephen, I'll try to address this and, and I'll tell you my understanding is what their data showed, is they just simply went out, uh, did a longitudinal study and looked at the results of teams, like what teams were still in business and how they were performing. And their data simply showed that teams that had, uh, that had won multiple awards versus teams that had won uh, single awards, the, the first time, and it's not single awards, it's first time winning teams. Uh, the first time winning teams were doing better. That's what their data showed, okay? That's what it showed. So hopefully that, uh, that addressed it, or that answered your question, okay? Uh, so the question is, what are the admin business roles that, is, that should exist in a phase one proposal? Uh, I just made, so accounting and finance, I just put that in there. Uh, so I think you clearly want to have somebody that's, that's helping out with finances because they're going to give you a, a chunk of money. Uh, I think that's one. Uh, I think that you want to have, um, uh, that you typically want to have something that's doing some type of customer discovery. Now, keep in mind, let me just be very clear with this as well. And Roland, you can chime in on this as well and make sure I don't uh, misstate something. The, the tricky part that you want to you've got to balance is that none of these business roles can be funded by dollars from your phase one from any of your SBIR dollars okay so anything like this has to be funded on external dollars okay but I always think about it like this so the question you're asking here is I always want in in my in my uh, SBIR proposals I want to want to give the impression and, and not even just give the impression but in reality, I want to, I, this is a business, right? I don't want this to look anything like that this is a research project. So I just think about what is a company? So don't think about in terms of what do you want an SBIR company to look like? It's what does a company look like uh, when you're growing a company? So just think about what, what does a company have 
to be successful, right? You want to have some, you want to have some finance, you want to have some bookkeeping, uh, you want to have some something that's do, doing some business development. And so just think about those type of roles and you want to have them in there, but that's different than what's going to be on the budget. Okay. So think about it like that. So, you know, you definitely want to have a section in your proposal on your commercialization plan that talks about those different roles, but that's a yeah. good question. And hopefully that, that answered it. But as you're putting that together, you know, you make sure you talk about, uh, talk to some, get some help as you're putting that together from, uh, uh, some of the EIRs at Research Park that can help you with that. But just let me just end this section with uh, uh, my strategy, my philosophy with SBIRs is don't don't uh, run your company just to get SBIRs, run it like a business. SBIRs are just a tool. So uh, anytime you, I, I can give a, anytime I can get an opportunity to state that I will. So uh, think about that question is what role should I have in my company uh, to be successful, and then just write your SBIR accordingly. Okay, yep. I'll a, leave that. Couple, a couple of comments uh, in addition to that. NSF will allow you to include a ten thousand dollar line item in your budget for accounting, and th this has only appeared in the last couple of years. But uh, right now, you you can actually have ten thousand dollars maximum for for accounting. So that's one thing I'll mention with NSF. The other agencies don't tend to do that. Usually accounting is part of your indirect rates. They're part of the general administrative expenses. Another thing I mentioned regarding uh, like the, the 360 degree full, firm, full formed uh, team is that one of the most common areas that I see a, a gap is a presence in the industry. Mm -hmm. Since we're a university here, we get lots of people with great new innovative ideas and they're developing some kind of invention that has to be marketed in the industry. But there's no real presence in the industry on the team. They're mm -hmm. going to market something for doctors because they're going to make a doctor's tool, but there are no doctors on the team. They're going to market a new uh, you know, pig disease thing for farmers, but there are no farmers on the team. And there's nobody on the team who knows the distribution mechanisms or all that goes into making a product and getting it out there. That's the typical large gap. And so that goes beyond just the nuts and bolts of accounting and legal and HR and stuff. But you need to have some kind of a presence and awareness of the field and some, some kind of a, uh, you know, presence there. I guess that's the best word. That's mm -hmm. the gap I often see. So you want to think about, all right, how can we really play in this arena? Do we have partners? Do we have someone who knows the field? How are we going to manufacture this? How are we going to get it out to distributors? That's an area that's a common gap and you need to think about when you're talking about your complete team. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Roland. Excellent. Okay. Let me uh, mention this. This next section is building to a phase two. So I'll just briefly mention uh, one thing that you need to make sure you cover when you're putting together a phase one, and that's addressing a phase two. So remember that, as Roland mentioned earlier, that a phase one is a feasibility research study. A phase two is considered a research towards a prototype and commercialization. So in your, excuse me, in your phase one, uh, I think it's always a good idea to show that you've got a plan and a vision beyond phase one. So a couple of things that I think you need to think about are some questions that I always uh, like to think about in that phase one is how are you going to get from where you are to a successful company, okay, to be a successful company. Uh, things that you that to consider is that uh, it takes significant funding to become a, a successful venture. Uh, it takes partners and it takes it and it'll take a successful for a, a phase two as well. So think about those points and then I'll always craft a paragraph or even a half a page and put it in towards the end of the phase one and discuss those next steps about how you're going to get there. OK, and it doesn't need to be a long section, but I'll always craft that section and put it in there at the end and show that you've got a vision about how to get there. OK, and it doesn't it's not being presumptuous to put it in there about it, talking about a phase two. But I've had several program directors talk about over the years that they like to see that vision that you're building towards a phase two and you're talking about it and that you you have a pathway from a phase one to a phase two and you're going to pull in external partners and uh, uh, other funding as well. So I think it's important to put that in there to, uh, to keep that uh, that vision. OK, so. I think that I would uh, I would uh, keep that uh, keep that in mind and include that section in there. Okay, so uh, that's all I'll I'll say there, and then I'll spend the last few minutes because uh, I do want to leave a few minutes in here for uh, uh, the review process. Okay, because I think it's always important to uh, 
keep in mind about what a, a review panel looks like. Now, as Roland mentioned at the beginning, is I spend, or I, every year I, I at least review once, if not twice, uh, for the National Science Foundation. And if you've never reviewed for them in the SBIR program, it's an interesting process. And I think it helps you write, it, it helps me, it's helped me uh, write better proposals over, over time. So let me just give you a brief background of it, and then we'll uh, leave some time for uh, uh, question and answer. So a typical panel at NSF uh, for their SBIR process or program, uh, either on a phase one or phase two, they're very similar. It's just different type of proposals. Uh, is what it typically looks like is that there are uh, six reviewers in general, and there's always uh, three. Or it's usually split in half, where there's uh, half of those are commercial reviewers, half of those are technical reviewers. I think it's important for you to understand what those reviewer, what the makeup of those reviewers are. They'll always have technical reviewers that are in the in the space or in this segment or industry of. Uh, or technical background of those type of the reviews that they're reviewing. Okay, the commercial reviewers are people like me. I am always a, a commercial reviewer, and so think about me as one of your reviewers. So I could review any of your proposals. Uh, I'm a technical person, but I will I will more than likely not be in the background of your uh, of the of the uh, of your space. Okay, so I think that's important to think about because if if someone like me. Uh, read your proposal and doesn't understand what you're doing, it, it is a problem for your proposal. Okay, so always think about that. You want to write your proposal in a way that someone like me can read it and at a high level understand what you're doing. Okay, so it hurts you if, if I can't understand your proposal, because sometimes I read proposals and I, and I read them and I'm just like, I don't understand what you're talking about. That's a problem. Okay, so think about that. Uh, is what will happen is in a phase one, I will get 10 to 12 proposals each one of them is about 60 pages when Fastlane compiles them all together. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, a phase two ends up being somewhere from 100 to 120 pages. Okay, when it compiles the commercialization plan, the proje uh, project description, all of the supplementary documents, it's 120 pages. And I'll have anywhere from four to six of them. That is a huge stack. Okay, so think about it like that. Okay. And that's a lot of them, okay? Uh, every once in a while, I've been on one that has a few, a few, uh, you know, maybe two or three, but usually it's anywhere from four to six, okay? And I'll review those the week before, and I'll read every single one of them, every page of that proposal, okay? I talked to a program manager one time, and I actually, I was, I was there visiting NSF. I stopped by his office, and he, he was reading them, and he told me he reads every one of those proposals multiple times before a panel. His opinion was, if someone takes the time to submit a proposal, I owe it to them to read them thoroughly. Okay, so those proposals are read. Okay, now I I always think this is this is something to think about, and I always recommend this because uh, you want to write a compelling proposal because no matter how hard uh, we're all humans, no matter how hard you try to read those proposals, if it's not compelling, it hurts you. Like I want to make sure that when you write a proposal. If, uh, if, I, if you read that first page, you want to make sure that that reviewer understands what you're doing and has a desire to read the rest of it <laughs> and it, it doesn't fall asleep, okay? So I think on your first page, you want to make sure that that person reads it and goes, I understand what they're doing and I want to turn to the rest. I want to turn through the rest of that proposal and, and understand, you know, I want, to read the, I want to read the end of it, right? I want to, I want to understand how the, end, how the rest of this proposal ends, okay? Like, read, think about like a novel. I, let, just one other thing, let me quickly say, when, how I read a proposal, I know many people do the same. I'll read that first page, and then where do I turn? I turn to the back, and I want to find the letters of support. And I'll read the letters of support, and I want to know who did you get to write you a letter of support, and what did they commit? Okay? Now, a couple of other things is every panel I've ever served on, after the, after the panel reviews it, they end up putting the proposals all into one of three buckets, either a fund, fund if possible, or do not fund. Okay, so the program, the program manager makes you put them in one of those buckets. Sometimes they end up on the line. They like they always put three columns on the board, on the whiteboard, and they make you put them in one of those. Sometimes they end up on the middle, but then ultimately you move them around. They end up in one of those buckets. Fund, fund if possible, or do not fund. And then you leave, the, then you're done. At the end of the day, you rank them all and then you leave. 
each proposal has about 20 minutes of conversation. And there's a lead reviewer for each one that leads the conversation. And then that's it. And then you never end up knowing what happens to those proposals. They may, they may get funded or not. You never know. So that's it. I always tell people is you don't want to end up in the do not fund. It could get funded if it's in do not fund, but you just don't want to end up there. You just want to end up in fund or fund if possible. Okay. I'll leave it at that for sake of time because I want to leave everybody uh, the next uh, five to seven minutes for questions if you have any. And I've got one question that's being asked. It's at what stage should I form a company and will that impact my postdoc at the university? That is a good question. I am going to, uh, I'm going to address the first part of that. I'm not sure I quite understand the second part. Maybe Roland could, could answer that part. But uh, the question of what, at what stage do I need to form a company? Okay. So we always, our strategy at the university and, and most of our programs are, you should form the company as late as possible. And that has nothing to do with SBIRs, but just in just in general, we always think it's uh, the later you can hold off on forming a company, the better, because things get a little complicated when you form a company. Okay, now in relation to SBIRs and submitting an SBIR, you have to uh, form a company in order to submit an SBIR. You don't have to form a company to submit a project pitch. Roland mentioned like for the National Science Foundation, you can uh, submit a pitch to the program managers and get feedback on whether that's appropriate for an SBIR, and they'll give you feedback within uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, but to submit an SBIR, you have to form a company. And the second part of that is, was how does that affect- Yeah, the, the postdoc. And the, the key there, I think, is that uh, you don't have to work for the company when you submit the proposal, but you have to agree to work for the company primarily if you get awarded for the proposal. So you're, if you're a postdoc, you can write the proposal, you can submit the proposal, continue with your postdoc work. If you get funding, you stop the postdoc and switch to the company. If you don't get NSF funding, you continue with your postdoc or go, go someplace else. Perfect. Well, I think maybe that means it's time to wrap up. I think if anybody, uh, we have dropped a few uh, points in the chat about where to find more information. Well, also, as I mentioned earlier, in case you weren't here, we are planning to have different content throughout the summer that you might want to join for, including some new faces that you will see who are part of the FAST Center. So uh, thank you so much. Yes, that, Kathy, for dropping that in the chat. That's where you can find resources information. And we'll, of course, send things out to you as well. So thanks. Thanks to our speakers. Thanks, Roland. Thanks, Jed. Thanks to Kathy for monitoring the chat. Thanks to everyone who participated today. Um, and we will hope to see you all again soon. So yeah, good, good luck, luck everybody, those. with your SBIR journey. Exactly. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. You are welcome. Have a good day.